to our final uh, closing uh, keynote speech. And uh, uh, the closing keynote speech will be uh, delivered uh, by uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, John Niedervan uh, Peters uh, from uh, uh, California University, Santa Barbara. Uh, many thanks for having uh, us here today, uh, Professor uh, Niedervan, and the floor is yours for your uh, keynote speech. Uh, Ibrahim, thank you very much for your organizing and invitation. Um, greetings to you all, um, audience uh, participants from many places. It's a pleasure to be able to see you when you have your um, video on. I speak to you with um, the enthusiasm of 6.30 in the morning because that's what time it is here. Um, I will do a bird's eye treatment on uh, the following points, multipolar globalization and populism, populism in advanced economies and political economy dynamics by region, and then some uh, general notes. Is my voice clear? All yes, your clear, Good. clear. we can hear you. So the first point in response to the question, is there a global rise of populism? In most of the global south, what leads is nationalism, so there is little room for, for, for populism, possibly extreme nationalism, which then sinks with the establishment. Secondly, development leads, which tend to be pragmatic, outward looking to investors, to uh, donors, which leaves little room for populist posturing. And of course, there are also many authoritarian government and national security states, which also have little space for different voices. The major outlier in the global south is Latin America, with a long tradition of left-wing populism, one Juan Perón, Getulio Vargas, and later on Lula da Silva, Hugo Chavez, Kirchner, Evo Morales, and more recently Pablo Castillo. Left-wing populism, pardon folks if you have already discussed this, but I make a brief point. I have not been able to, uh, to follow everything because of the time difference, seeks a combination of government and labor, whereas right-wing populism leans towards a pact of government and capital. In Latin America, the background is 300 years of Spanish, Portuguese colonialism and then American influence. I leave uh, details aside. Asia, 60% of the world population. Generally, there is no populism, but there are outliers. Number one, the Philippines, where Duterte represented the security side, policing the poor, whereas earlier Fernand Marcos represented the national security state inspired with the role of the military, inspired by uh, U.S. influence. Part of the situation in the Philippines is 300 years Spanish colonialism, 30 years American colonialism and no land reform. And of all of Asia, the Philippines comes closest to, to Latin America. Um, the current government, uh, Obibi Marcos, um, is a professional, uh, well-organized government. At least its campaigns are well-organized. Um, I turn to South Asia, India, which media often describe as populist, Modi, but the BJP is an established party, is the political arm of the RSS that goes back to the 1920s with Hindutva and, so to speak, a Hindu Jugend uh, that spawned the assassination of Gandhi. Modi here is the PR front, front man, the power lies with Amit Shah and uh, RSS. 
um, the BJP is close with major, major oligarchs, Ambani, Adani, Infosys, and Modi is probably a tool because take into account that RSS has a hundred years of history and a deep anchor and probably a bigger agenda than populism. The heading here, appropriate heading, is electoral authoritarianism. There is also a new study of spin dictatorship, i.e. savvy use of media, social media and technology, deep fakes and a chat GPT to gain advantage. Think of Erdogan, Maduro, Hungary, Russia, Singapore, uh, Israel and so forth. What is probably a populist figure in Asia is Imran Khan in, um, in Pakistan. With an agenda of anti-corruption, Islam, and a welfare state, a state of Medina, uh, which are themes with deep mooring. Uh, in the Middle East, generally, no populism, rather national security states. In Syria, Assad holds power uh, in a minority ethnocracy combination of Alevi and Druze, while the majority is Sunni, um, and the emphasis is on security. It's a national security state. In Israel, of course, Likud is an established party. Um, Netanyahu now moves to the extreme right, sides with extreme ultra-Orthodox Zionists and settler Jews, and seeks control of the judiciary, the Supreme Court, which alienates the population and now also alienates the military, um, his dismissal of the defense minister, and Israel is a national security state. Uh, in Africa, generally, no populism more authoritarianism, established parties or rising parties. Ethnic mobilization is a bit old style. Um, and the new style leader in Kenya, uh, William Ruto, um, has overtaken this kind of ethnic mobilization. Um, brief note on Russia. In Russia, generally speaking, um, there is only room for for nationalism. Let's mention the Wagner group, uh, ultra-right, it may rise, Navalny, uh, anti-corruption nationalist, um, may also still have a future. So actually, most populism we find, not in the low income, not in the middle income, but in the high income um, advanced economies question, what enables this populism? You have all discussed it already. I make some brief points. What are the political economy dynamics? I would list the following. Destabilizing political economy, post-industrialism, deindustrialization, destabilizing politics, collapse of stable coalitions. Second, financializations, hedge funds, derivatives, represent, so to speak, a chaos capital without enduring commitments. Um, <clears throat> creating a billionaire world, and the billionaire motto is, it is about what I like. Disruptive technology, hence disruptive po politics. Media, which are more uh, in show business than in truth business, was only selective uh, truth, and a wider context of global inequality, uh, extreme inequality, wars in the Middle East, uh, of which the European Union carries the burden. Now, general point, learning curves and professionalization of populism represents one, the right wing goes to the center, seeking the electoral sweet spot, conservative family values and moderate economics. We see that in France, Italy, Sweden. Keep some right-wing agenda points for uh, votes and immigration. The center goes to the right, 
for instance, Biden in the U.S., adopts some, while rejecting Trump politics, adopts some Trump policies, um, Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS, CHIPS Act, protectionism, and banning links with China. Now, let's consider the Atlantic economies, the U.S. and the U.K., with liberal market economies. And here, liberalism, of course, means individual rights, not social rights. Liberalism also means no guardrails for corporations, tech, tech, technology, media. Therefore, deindustrialization without a safe, safety net and without social investment, uh, hiding behind capitalism in general. What is not discussed, by the, by the, by the way, is the Keynesian military-industrial complex, a trillion-dollar mega-corporation corp which sets terms for other corporations. Meanwhile, cut the social state, expand the law and order state with mandatory uh, sentencing laws and so forth, uh, extreme inequality and heavy policing in the United States of poor and minorities. Populism here, of course, is also a response, as you uh, mentioned, to the 2008 crisis. And populism in the Atlantic economies means populism with a broad agenda, because the state is absent in many spheres. We turn to continental Europe, predominantly with coordinated market economies, and note that in the European Union, in uh, Liberal means pro-business parties, low taxes, low conservative, a conservative leaning. Here we have generally deindustrialization with safety net, with social in investment, a trend towards over time balancing outward and inward investments, although also with wage repression in Germany. Um, Nevertheless, there is, of the, since 2000, austerity, government cutbacks, and also pressure from liberal market economies, causing a tax drain, tax avoidance, and tax havens, uh, giving rise to uh, both uh, indignados and right-wing populist movements that emphasize anti-immigration and Islam as issues. Um, in Germany, the uh, Alternative für uh, Deutschland are marginal, have become marginal. In Sweden, the Sweden Democrats rise. In the Netherlands, we see a roller coaster um, pattern. The Freedom Party, for instance, is high, 20% when Islam matters, but uh, drops down to 7% or 8% of seats when cr economic crisis is on the agenda. It does not have a distinctive economic pro program. Uh, notes on Eastern Europe. The background here, I think, is an authoritarian Catholic tradition which organized the majority response to Soviet occupation was not the only influence, but the best organized and culturally, the deepest culturally anchored. Let's consider Hungary, the role of the Catholic Church, Christian Democrat Party, and Fidesz. And Fidesz, by a fluke, in 2010, gained a two-third majority in parliament and changed the constitution, introducing the fundamental law and then the national social system. Add a fence on the border with Serbia, anti-immigrants and refugees, add conservative family values, and demonize Soros and oppose the Central European University, oppose globalization, and here, voila, a populist icon emerges. Here we find a mafia state with a bespoke constitution and oligarchs and, kleptop and kleptocracy that deploys culture war as a fig leaf. 
it is an authoritarian dream come through that cherry picks globalization yes to china no to brussels the counterpoints i think are um, that eu uh, funding is conditional about the separation of powers independence of the judiciary and voting in the cities poland with a similar background still struggles to control the courts notes on mediterranean europe um in the mediterranean the cold war has led to conservative coalitions uh, anti-communist anti-union anti-socialist parties in italy for instance this came with a lasting coalition of christian democrat parties and the mafia with support of the security apparatus. Then came Berlusconi and Lega North and now Lega. Uh, Giorgia Meloni uh, goes to the center, chisels rough edges of, of the party, takes advice from Mario Draghi, keeps some elements of the Fratelli Party, anti-immigration conservative values, accepts the European Union. Um, let's consider France. Um, Marie Le Pen renames the Front National to Rassemblée Nationale, consider that this name itself to the us, uh, is close to the Assemblée Nationale, the Parliament. Um, she takes distance from the crude position of her father, Holocaust denial, etc., adopts a different language, a different dress, more presidential style, acceptable to the main, mainstream, and takes professional advice in media presentation, etc. Again, the theme is here, seek the electoral sweet spot, moderate economics, conservative family values, and accept the EU. It's the smart move after the debacle of Brexit. All right, this is a quick bird's eye overview. Uh, pardon the short notes, um, colleagues. Now, some uh, general points. Uh, because I try to stay within the time frame. Those who study ethnicity know that ethnic mobilization doesn't just pop up from the grassroots. Ethnic entrepreneurs stoke the flames, lead the movement, and often they are typically bicultural, bilingual, conversant in both minority and majority culture, while many of the rank and file are more monocultural. The issue here is organization that must be capable and effective. Populism or what media Call, call populism is similar. The key issue is organization, leadership, methods, technology, and timing. Populism means rising outside the established parties, break with institutions, start a new movement of a party. It doesn't just mean speaking directly to people because all politicians try to do that. Right-wing populism offers a responsibility discount. Don't care about immigrants, refugees, minorities, foreign countries, globalization. They don't matter. All that matters is your country and your interest first. A feature of the populist organizations is generally that as new forces, they have less cultural, a traditional mooring and anchoring. When the issue of, and there is, voters have more issue loyalty than party loyalty. Um, when the issue vanishes, the party vanishes. Think of UKIP in Britain uh, after the debacle of, uh, of uh, Brexit. Um, um, if the issue is deep, well anchored, like Imran Khan's anti-corruption issues in, in Pakistan, um, 
and the party the organization is capable and effective then there is a strong chance of survival um some further notes um we live in a cartoon world we deal with representations of what happens not with what actually happens and making representations cartoons and showing them is professional work ours is also a world of entanglements many of them are hidden from uh, view uh, intelligence think tanks donors parties factions and media much is under the table i give you a rumor hearsay say american intelligence feeds selective information about china to australian intelligence which leaks part of it to the rupert murdoch press while frictions between uh, China and Australia are already going on. Five years later, there is AUKUS, which means a break for Australia with its largest trade partner. Seven years later, there are nuclear sub submarines. I can carry on along these lines. Ibrahim, how is my time, please? Sorry? How is my timing? Uh, indeed, you have uh, almost uh, more than uh, 10 minutes. I still have 10 minutes to go. My dear, then I was too fast. Um, I have. Also, uh, please give us some time to uh, ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Yes, 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 please. That, that will be fine because I can give details, but maybe yes. in questions yes. that would be uh, more appropriate. Thank you. So, so are you stopping at this level or? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, use my privilege to ask the first question. So, you have published uh, several fascinating books, uh, especially. Uh, globalization and culture and globalization or empire are the two uh, most impressive book uh, from my viewpoint. So my question is that you are a sociologist. That is why I'm asking that question. How strongly globalization and multilateralism are related? Uh, are they necessarily related with each other? And how? Globalization in my view, essentially means growing connectivity of people over time, a time of thousands of, of years. Multilateralism is one modality, one form of organizing this connectivity from the point of view of certain forces. Um, I think of what was just said in the previous session by one of the colleagues, I think Marcus, um, about China. And he mentioned the Taiwan risks, et cetera. Colleagues, what I would add here is take into account that China has just performed some master moves that have historical weight that changed patterns. One, it brokered talks between Iran and Saudi. This is a big change of pattern in the Middle East. It leaves the United States aside. Secondly, um, it presented Xi Jinping, visited uh, Vladimir Putin, Moscow, and presented a 12-point peace plan. The first point of the peace, the peace plan and the foundation, the basis was that negotiations must start from the foundation of recognition of the principle 
of territorial sovereignty in accordance with the UN Charter, the Westphalen Principle. This is deliberate and by design because this is not in the wheelhouse of Russia. Of course, the Ukraine war is an, um, a major aggression and also not of the United States because both Russia and the United States since Cold War, war times have not respected West Westphalen and are not part of the multilateralism of the UN Charter. They are part of the UN Security Council, which gives them veto power. But in a certain sense, there are two units here, the rule of law, international law, Westphalen, and so forth, and the rule of power with the UN Sec Security Council. So we have multilateralism, a multilateralism of law, and a multilateralism of power. And China, breaks through this. Um, the third point that I would add here is China's... Um, China operates within a different time frame. It operates because it has a 3,000 year history of stateness of a certain kind and deep traditions, deeply anchored in time, the Confucianism and so forth operates in a different wavelength than, say, the United States. The United States is a thin modernity. Uh, I've looked in my garden here um, for Roman ruins. I have not found them. Um, it's a thin modernity. Practically all societies in the world, you find tribes, peasants, feudalism, empires, monarchy, trade pacts, bourgeoisie, and then comes industrialism, uh, industrialism and post-industrialism and so forth. The United States is only at that latter part. Um, so China is operating, the, and China is more patient, and Chinese capital is more patient. They they do Belt and Road Initiative, three trillion dollar investment in the regional and global economy. They suffer losses and failures, surely, but that sense of time, their capital is a more patient capital than the capital of Wall Street. Um, so uh, multilateralism, there is there are many kinds of multilateralism. The multilateralism of the great powers the multilateralism of the middle powers and the small countries, practically all of which stand by the UN Charter. The great powers do not. Russia and the United States do not. So we have multiple multi multilateralism. Note, uh, sorry to carry on, but note further that Saudi Arabia in an, um, one intends to join the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, and China. Uh, Argentina also, Turkey also, several African countries also. Then an announcement yesterday, Saudi Arabia wants to join, intends to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is known as the Asian counterpoint to NATO. So these are very major in developments. Now, practically, quickly to respond to uh, to Marcus Tauber's point, uh, I think China is patient with Taiwan also, and can be able to and likely be able to stretch this over a long period of time, not two three years at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? I think uh, there is no more. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Bülent, uh, please ask your question. Your sound, Bülent. 
Bülent yo e, unmute ya. Ya ya. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the professor Peter sir. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful and inspiring speech. Uh, you know uh, in recent decades people have always been talking about globalism uh, beside of multilateralism or multilateralism. Uh, if globalism is a reality, uh, I think it, 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 in my humble opinion, it necessitates an effective and fair governance. Uh, do you think that the world has uh, today such a global governance, effective and fair governance? If not, what kind of global governance we need to prevent populist autocrats uh, abuse or exploitation of the system to gather uh, support from uh, the people? Thank you. Burhan, thank you. Um, I think there are many kinds of globalism. Orban came to Dallas, Texas uh, recently and said, um, I am not joining the globalists. I come to Dallas, to Texas, and we are anti-globalists. In the meantime, what Orban does is cherry picking globalization. He says, uh, China, yes, European Union, Brussels, no, Russia may, may be. In other words, he seeks to um, work on a register of um, maneuverability. Next point, a key theme, World Economic Forum, etc., in globalism, uh, globalization now, is polycrisis, multi-crisis. We are in an era of climate change, extreme inequality, a major war, uh, with an energy squeeze and a food squeeze and inflation and so on and so forth. And we have just come out of COVID. In such a polycrisis, people, my sense is that people generally are weary of um, populist posturing um, and see capable government, maybe technocracy, um, that deals with issues. Uh, one more issue on uh, global governance. Well, and it's a, it's a really big issue. My sense is that what comes closest now in terms of the interests of the world majority, global south, middle power, all small countries, is the UN Charter, the UN General Assembly. The UN Security Council is in a different, that is made up of the victors of the previous uh, major war, World War II, with uh, veto rights, and that represents more um, the rule of power than the rule of law. Um, UN Charter and the rule of law is what interests the world majority most because it represents an engagement with global responsibility. Right-wing populists gives us, give us a responsibility discount. Um, Types like Orban say all of these things do not uh, matter. If we do serious um, global engagement, it is wise that we work with the UN Ch Charter and work with with international law. <clears throat> Does that answer your um, your concerns? Yeah, maybe you can suggest some uh, solutions. Also, the this uh, gap of uh, or, uh, the deficit of the global governance, uh, because uh, there are lots of uh, people around the world that they are not satisfied with the current uh, so-called global global governance. Uh, maybe a reform for uh, Europe, U uh, United Nations system uh, is a need uh, to do that. What do you think about that? Uh, Buland, my sense is that we also face, of course, you were referring to it, global governance deficits. I am writing now 
uh, an analysis, an article on great power narcissism. And um, it's typically large countries that are inward looking, less international and engaged. Uh, foreign trade is a smaller share of their economy, etc. And my sense is that the world majority is getting increasingly wary and loses patience with some of the great power narcissism. I have a sense that people are weary, are tired of the dollar system and in the movements of China, Saudi, BRICS wants to start a new currency. There are elements of stepping away from, from that because being uh, followers of the American economy um, and the federal uh, bank um, has its limitations. People are weary of the American permanent war economy. In the past 70 years, um, the United States has not been at war, not engaged in an invasion or covert operation uh, for only two years, 1977 and 79. And it's cornering countries and bullying and pressuring countries with um, national endowment of democracy in the name of bringing democracy to the Middle East, etc. People also, um, the world majority is losing patience uh, with this and losing also the credibility uh, with this and um, always claiming the bringing democracy, while democracy in the United States is not particularly doing doing well, uh, is flagging, um, is also a weak point. So I sense that, yes, the deficits are glaring in global governance. The needs in view of poly crisis are also glaring. And the impatience with um, the great powers, like in particular, um, the United States are, and Russia is also wearing thin. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I... <clears throat>